about, uh, about her new book, Steel Closets, and we're going to learn a little bit about, well, I don't know exactly, but <laughs> in this here piece of paper, it says we're going to learn about some of the steel mines workers, the queer workers in the steel mines in northern Indiana. So please join me in welcoming Anne. So after I had 
contacted about 15 that way and interviewed them, what I did was call up a local columnist named Jerry Davich. He runs a sort of feature profile thing in the local papers. And I said, meet me for lunch. I'll tell you what I have so far. If you like what you hear, you can write a little column about me and maybe that will attract more interviews. So we met for lunch. He liked what he heard. He wrote a column. So let me read to you about what happened after that. I don't know if I can read when there's a microphone since I have to look down. January 24th, 2011. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Yes. My name and phone number were included in the column. This led to hostile voicemails and even a few death threats. My favorite was from a woman saying she had worked in the steel mills for 30 years and could guarantee that only Christian people and no disgusting perverts like me worked with her. Hindsight led me to see the irony in this claim because that day seven disgusting perverts like me called and left contact information so that I could subsequently interview them. And that was just the start. Following that column, I interviewed 20 more people in the space of about three weeks, or probably the busiest three weeks of my life. And also, in many ways, the most intense experience I've ever had because the life of a queer steel worker is really hard. The jobs are challenging, dangerous, difficult. Being gay in anywhere, especially in Northwest Indiana, is challenging, dangerous, and difficult. If you combine those two things, <coughs> these people's stories were really intense to hear. And hearing that many of them in that enclosed a little bit of time was an intense experience. But the stories were also amazing. People who really feel like their jobs are important, what they do is important, have an intense sense of community in terms of what they do and how they do it. So even though it was sort of emotionally draining to hear the stories, it was also a really powerful experience. After almost every interview, I had to re reinterpret what it meant to be a hero, what it meant to be a person who was a survivor. It was really cool. So then I thought, all right, I'm gonna have to write a book about this. But I also wanted to know why it was so hard to be gay in the steel mills. What specifically about the steel mills makes it such a challenging setting? So that's what I'll talk about next. Uh, um, this is supposed to start here. <laughs> Demonstrating that steel mills are isolated, slow to change, and stable begins to explain why the big integrated mills are so inhospitable to queers. They're isolated geographically. You can't just go there. Whenever I tried to visit one, they would stop me, ask for ID, tell me to leave. Even if I just tried to go take photos, cops or security guards would shoo me away instantly. So they're geographically isolated from the rest of the world and kind of historically isolated. They were built in the 1890s up to around 1920. That's when the mills that are still there were built. So, and they're not really any different than when they were built. Some things have changed. There's electronic firing instead of coal firing, but the structure is kind of the same. And that means that in many ways, the behavior is kind of the same. So they're really isolated in lots of ways, geographically, physically, sort of temporally. It's almost like when you go into them, you're stepping back into the past in a lot of ways in terms of how women are treated, how minorities are treated, how gay people are treated. So that isolation is part of what causes this. When a community is permeable and new people flow in and out of it regularly or interact with its principal players in significant ways, it stands to reason that it would be more likely to change than a community that is closed and therefore re reinforces its inherited patterns. 
R.W. Connell attributes homophobia in working class work settings to traditional family ideology and accompanying gender roles, which he notes persist in ethnic enclaves and isolated areas longer than they would in more mobile, heterogeneous communities. So there's a tradition in the world in general that when you're young and you're coming up and you realize you might be gay, what do you do? Move to the city. That's sort of the traditional model of what we say gay people do. But these are people who don't do that. For whatever reason, they like where they live, they identify with it, they like what they do, or maybe it's the only job they have or the only job they think they can have. They have family there, their parents work there. For whatever reason, these people don't want to participate in the whole, we will flee to the city where everything is safe. They stay in the mill. And so there's that continuity traditionally and over time, and therefore, a lack of change happens. In addition, steel workers often do their work in pairs or groups, depending on their coworkers for their success and their survival. A situation that creates a certain solidarity reinforced by the exclusion of difference of some or all of women, blacks, ethnics, or queers. So you feel more bonded as a group if you exclude outsiders. We all remember this from seventh grade, right? There's a way that when I talk to audiences about this, it feels like a perpetual continuation of seventh grade. That kind of group mentality and behavior. But also because it's dangerous and isolated, that gets kind of expanded. And people get excluded who are women, minorities, ethnic groups, queer people. What if you're all of those? then you're going to be excessively isolated in those kinds of settings. William Sarin has published a history of the Homestead Steel Mills, which are outside of Pittsburgh, in which he observes that the communal nature of the work creates familiarity and uniformity. Oshana, she's one of my steel workers, so I wound up interviewing 40 people. 40 people signed the consent form and agreed to be interviewed. I don't use their names in the book, I gave them alphabetical aliases in the order that I interviewed them. So in the book, when I quote somebody and use their name, that's not their real name. Um, Olshana remembers, I had the feeling that when I was there, with such big things going on all around you, I really think that people had a sense that their lives were in the hands of their coworkers, and you never knew when you would have to depend on that coworker to do something that would save your life or get you out of the way. So you may not get along outside, or you may not hang out outside, but in the mill you were kind of forced to be attentive and cooperative with your co-workers, no matter who they were. So if a co-worker might have to snatch you out of harm's way, you need to trust that person, which is a feeling that often derives from shared values. Working partnerships and a sense of community are crucial for safety, and they can be a significant source of pleasure as well. A woman quoted in James Lane's, James Lane's Calumet Regional Steelworker Tales, which is a collection of steelworker tales that's existed since the 80s. And these aren't identified as gay people, they're just steelworkers. But this worker points out that, quote, in the mill you would be assigned to an experienced millwright and would basically just hang around with him for six or eight months. The two people would do everything together. They'd eat lunch and take their breaks together. The training partnership was a social relationship when it worked well, and just being a woman made that difficult. And that's something she says in the 80s about being female, let alone being a minority or a gay person. But the point of me telling you this story is that kind of pleasure of the cooperative work experience, which is really important, and something that I remember from being a mechanic. As a professor, I work in my office or in classrooms, and in classrooms, you interact with students, but you don't interact with your colleagues. So in terms of interaction with colleagues, as a professor, you have to make the effort to do it. And as a car mechanic, that wasn't an effort. We hung out in a large open car shop. We interacted all the time. I knew everything about those guys. Their favorite movies, their favorite food. I mean, partly because you're bored and you have a lot of time on your hands, so you just kind of talk. So that sort of camaraderie, and shared stuff, like we used to routinely compete about things. Volvo ball joints, I don't know if any of you have Volvos. The ball joints go bad all the time. 
So we would compete. Somebody would take the right and somebody would take the left and see who could do it faster. And you're at the distance of a car from each other. So there's a lot of kind of talking and, and that isn't present in lots of white collar work settings. That kind of sharing of daily life. And the sort of pleasure of doing that and also the pleasure of feeling like the work that you do is important. You're doing something that's material and that other people need to survive. Those things are part of what creates the pleasure of the work setting. And that relies on this kind of camaraderie. For example, Zach, another of the steel workers that I interviewed, describes navigating the mill's group mentality and what happens if you don't fit in. He says, we help each other at work, so to me it's still good. It is what it is. You know, it could be a whole lot worse. I mean, it could be horrible. I'd say in that kind of environment, if they don't like you, they're going to make your life hell. Another of the narrators, Bernard, whose co-workers suspect he's gay, though he has never explicitly said so. I mean, if you meet Bernard, you can't miss it. <laughs> has felt ostracized more often than not. In one incident that he told me about, a manager was also belittling and harassing me that I'm not being manly enough to do the job. He would do it with an audience of people. I'd go to the section manager about it. Nothing would change this man's behavior. The thing that came to a head was October 21st at, three, at the 3 to 11 shift, I had went to the restroom. I was coming back to the tempered metal line when Sal stopped me. He says, nobody likes you. All the guys don't like you. You don't work with nobody, you don't help out, you're not participating, and everybody's going to go to management to have you kicked out of the sequence and put in labor somewhere else in the mill. Incidents like this one illustrate how groups of workers can create a sense of shared values through identifying a common enemy. And a person whose gender or sexuality don't fit the norm is often chosen for that position. The tar this targeting of sexual outsiders is possible in part because people in the 20th century, and 21st now, have identified sexual orientation as a meaningful component of identity, maybe the meaningful component. Eve Sedgwick observes that same-sex desire and behavior has a long, rich history, and that what changed at the turn into the 20th century was that, I'm quoting Sedgwick here, every given person, just as he or she was necessarily assignable to a male or female gender, was now considered necessarily assignable as well to a homo or a heterosexuality. A binarized identity that was full of implications, however confusing, for even the ostensibly least sexual aspects of life. Everyone, straight, gay, and otherwise, feels the effects of this change, as our sexual orientation defines who and what we are both broadly and deeply. Without this shift, it might have been possible to argue that being gay is irrelevant to job source or work culture, job choice or work culture. As it is, being gay or lesbian isn't seen as something a person stops doing at work, since it sets the terms of possibility for myriad actions and conversations that bear no direct relationship to sex or gender. Like really, what does your sexual orientation have to do with your work life? If the world was set up differently, nothing. I mean, it's something you do <coughs> at other parts of your life. But because of how sexual orientation functions in our culture at this time, it has to do with everything. Everything that you do is affected by the identity that you said to like permeate your entire life. That's a particular historical or cultural thing. It's not just like a given. It just feels like a given to us because we're a part of this culture. Furthermore, being gay is not just half of a binary, it's the stigmatized half. The other half, easy to blame or victimize, since as a minority, queers define what counts as straight simply by representing its opposite. So it's not just that sexual identity permeates everything, it's that one sexual identity is the bad one, or the one that could stigmatize, label, identified as the wrong kind of sex to be having and the wrong kind of identity to be having at work. So I read those sections to give you a sense of how the mill culture is different from regular life. 
Um, almost any other industrial setting isn't as hard on gay people as the mills are. So industrial settings and blue collar workplaces are harder to be gay than white collar or pink collar workplaces. But the mills are harder even than that. So if you look at auto workers, for example, they have an easier time. Why? One argument is their jobs are less geographically isolated. And their jobs are not as sort of big and scary and horrifying. So one thing that happens to steel workers is they see people die, get hurt, get injured. The sort of danger of the daily work is really high, and that creates this kind of community in which it's easy to ostracize people in order to create a sense of co-workers working together. That's one of the things that happens. And there's also a significant amount of long-term dangers. So there's both accident and injury that happens right away, <coughs> and there's cancer, which is really, really, really common. Even in the people that I interviewed, how many of them had cancer? I didn't ask, but a lot of them told me, and it was really a high number. There's asbestos everywhere, benzene everywhere, all kinds of cancer-causing chemicals all over the mills all the time. So the um, incidence of mesothelioma, lymphoma, all kinds of cancer are really high. So that creates another kind of dangerous atmosphere in which people are working that makes it easy for them to ostracize anybody because of the kind of stress of working in those sorts of circumstances. It's a little like being in the military. The danger and risk that you experience creates a really tight bond that's really important and valuable. If you've ever talked to anyone who was a soldier, they don't like, like it, but it is really kind of intense and important in the sort of formation of their identity and who they are and what they do. So the difficulty and danger of the experience